Good morning. Uh, for those of you who are new here or haven't been here for a while, I often talk about my cousin Ozzie, who's from Nunda, South Dakota. And Ozzie is what we call a slow walker. And what we mean by that is he's never in a hurry to get anywhere. He never gets stressed out. He never does anything. He, he doesn't work. He just kind of hangs out in, uh, at Lars's Tavern. And that's where his whole life revolves around. He's not a churchgoer. And he's not a religious person. But his girlfriend, Olga Norberg, insisted that he go to church with her on Easter service. And so he did. Well, Pastor Sandvig, the uh, minister, the pastor of the Second Lutheran Church in Nunda, South Dakota, thought that because there was such a big turnout, he'd take advantage of it and talk about the evils of alcohol and the harm that it does to the body. Now, to do this, he had an illustration. He put a table in the middle of the stage, and on the table he put a mason jar, and then he poured about an eighth of an inch of alcohol in the jar. He then put a worm inside the jar, and he stepped back, and he said nothing for five minutes. Everybody in the audience watched that worm wiggle around inside the jar until finally, after about five minutes, it died. Pastor Sandvig scanned the audience, looking into their eyes, and he says, what does this tell you about alcohol? Nobody answered. They knew his point. They just looked down and remained silent, except for Cousin Ozzy. He stood up and he says, this tells us that we drink alcohol. We'll never have worms. <laughs> Yeah, what would we do without Cousin Ozzy? We'd have to make him up. And see, listen, when I was growing up, there was a man in my hometown named Richard. Uh, I'm just going to call him Richard. And Richard was a, a very short man, and he's also a mean and nasty man. He never had a kind word to anybody. Very harsh in his expression. The people that knew him well said that when Richard was a young child, he was also small, and he was teased a lot, and he was called names even by his father, and that resulted in him being a very repulsive person. Well, Richard was a welder. He welded water towers. When a water tower sprang a leak of some sort, he would go inside the water tower with his straps and his belt on, and he would weld it and fix it. One day, something happened and he fell 25 feet and landed on his head. Thank God he survived. He went to the hospital, he was in a coma for about seven or eight days, and when he came to, he had lost his entire memory. This is a true story, by the way. All the people in the town who had been abused by him for years and years and years still came to see him. They felt sorry for him. And when they came to see him, they were very kind and they were very loving. Well, as time went by and Richard began to regain his memory, he was able to remember who he was, he was able to remember where he was, but he did not remember that he was a mean and nasty little man. He became the way he was being treated, very lovable and very kind. Now, I've always found that, and remained that way, I've always found that interesting. And I thought to myself on occasion, what would happen if for some reason I lost my memory? Who would I become? If I was able to, to lose all of the, the baggage that I've carried forth, all of the, the tragic childhood memories, all of the, the guilt and all of the shame and all of the things that sometimes upset me and sometimes make me feel very bad about myself, if I lost all that, who would I become? Who would you become if one day you woke up and you forgot who you were? Well, last week I talked about increasing the quality of our lives. And the question was, what causes the quality of our lives to be at the level that it is? And the natural answer to that is our thoughts. Our thoughts create our reality. We all know that. I say that almost every Sunday. Thoughts create our reality. The second point, though, is what creates the way we think. We're all different. We all think differently. But well, what causes that? 
what causes us to perceive the world and to think about the world and to feel the way we do that is different from everybody else to a certain degree? And the answer to that is our belief system. Our belief system tells us what we like and what we dislike. It tells us who we are and, and what we think about ourselves. It tells us uh, what we need to resist and what we need to accept. It governs every experience that we have in life. Now, we weren't born with a belief system, but rather it was given to us. When we were a young baby that came into this world, we didn't have a belief system. We didn't have any opinions or thoughts or feelings or attitudes or perceptions. We just were. But as we began to grow, our parents, older siblings, authoritative figures, teachers, preachers, social circles, social norms imposed upon us or impressed upon us different notions. And we accepted those notions without hesitation, without question, because we were young. And that developed our belief system. Until we were about seven or eight years old, our belief system continued to build. And at that point, our belief system was complete. And I don't mean in all of our, our attitudes, but it was complete in, in a general way. And this is what I think about the world and how to maneuver through it. Now, the problem is, a lot of the things that were impressed upon us weren't true, and they weren't good for us. Many things that uh, people experienced growing up uh, greatly damaged their self-esteem, especially when it came from parents. But nevertheless, we accept this, and we begin to live our lives according to this belief system. Now the problem is, as we grow up, we become so dependent on this belief system that we accept it to the point where we rely on it automatically. When we move into a situation or circumstance, we don't think about how to uh, respond or to react. We just do so automatically. We just, we just, um, the belief system just puts out there the reaction that we're going to have. Now, many of the things that we react to, we do so in a negative way. And when we react in a negative way, <clears throat> we get a feeling within ourselves that isn't good. And that is the brilliance of our mind. When we move into a situation or a circumstance, any event or activity, the first thing we do is we perceive what is going on. After we perceive what is going on, our belief system sends forward a, a thought or an, an attitude of some sort that tells us what this means to us. When that thought affects our brain cells, it releases a chemical. And our thoughts have a vibration level. If the vibration level is high, it is light, it is upbeat, it is positive. When the vibration level is low, it is a negative vibration. It weakens us. It is, it, it, it is heavy. It weighs us down. So if our thoughts are something of resistance, or if it's something that we don't like, the thought creates a chemical that in turn causes an emotion that feels good or it feels bad. Now, as I said before, we rely on this uh, belief system to the point that it's almost automatic. We're on autopilot. And as we go through life, we cause a lot of problems for ourselves. We run into a lot of situations and circumstances that don't feel good. We create conflict within our relationships, all because we're just going by the belief system that was given to us. You know, a man had this very problem. He was tired of life. He was tired of the routine that he was living. And so he decided to take a trip, and he went to Egypt. While he was in Egypt, he went to Alexander the Great's library, which at one time was the greatest library in the world, but it burned down, and now it was nothing but rubble. As he was walking through the rubble, he tripped over a rock and fell down. But in doing so, he turned the rock over, and beneath it there was a page from a book, an ancient book that somehow had survived the fire. On the page, there was a map, and on the map, there was an X marking a spot on a coastline that was nearby. And there was a story on the page that told, on this coastline, there was a special stone called the Touchstone. It is a black, shiny stone, and whoever finds this stone and holds it in their hand, it's warm to the touch, whatever they wish for, it'll be given to them. So he goes to the coastline to find the Touchstone. But his hopes were dashed when he arrived because the entire coastline was filled with black, shiny stones. 
But he was determined. He decided he was going to find the touchstone, and he concluded that the only way to do that was to start picking up stones, and if it wasn't warm to the touch, it wasn't the touchstone. He also concluded, so as not to pick up the same stone twice, if you picked up a stone and it wasn't warm to the touch, he was going to throw it into the ocean. So he began his search. Picking up a stone, if it wasn't warm, throwing it into the ocean. This went on for days, went on for weeks, and then finally months. Picking up a stone, throwing it into the ocean. Picking up a stone, throwing it into the ocean. Until one day, he picks up the stone, it was warm to the touch, it was the touchstone. But he is so habitual in his actions and his thoughts that he threw it into the ocean. <laughs> now I tell you this because it's very much like our lives. You know, we want more love in our lives, we go out and search for it. We want more peace in our lives, we go out and search for it. We want more happiness in our lives, we go out and search for it. But we get so wrapped up in the habitual way that we, we go through our day-by-day -day, uh, processes that even when love is there, we don't see it. Or when happiness is there, we get so caught up in the search and in the desire to have that, that we completely miss the opportunities to experience that which we desire the most. Great philosophers, spiritual masters, and teachers for ages have said that there's a way to increase the quality of our lives. And they say the way to do that is to increase what you value in your life. And they also say that which is of the greatest value is not of the material world, but it's of the spiritual world. It is like love, it is peace, it is harmony, it is happiness. Those are the true values in life. And they say when you have a consistent level of experiencing love and peace and happiness, life becomes very blissful. Jesus called this life the kingdom of heaven. Now, when he talked about the kingdom of heaven, he wasn't talking about a destination that we may or may not go to when we leave this world. He was talking about a way of life, a way of thinking, a way of perceiving. Moving through life where you're continually experiencing that which is of true value to you. Jesus said, if you want to experience the kingdom of heaven, you have to be born again. Now, many traditional churches have taken that. It means that you need to lay down your life and turn it over to Jesus Christ. But he didn't mean that at all. When he meant rebirth or to be reborn, he didn't mean reincarnated or to literally be reborn, but he meant the rebirth of the mind. And that is releasing the commitment or the embrace that we have in this belief system that we've been given to release it and allow other thoughts to come in. New thoughts. See, this belief system that we're given doesn't work for us because it's kind of a one-size-fits-all. It was handed down to us, and there's nothing wrong with that at all. That's a natural evolutionary process. Just as we inherited our genetic makeup, everybody in here inherited a belief system. So it's up to us, if you consider the belief system that you inherited, to uh, be kind of like a starter kit. Okay, this will get you going, get moving. But if we understand that that is not the end all, that we have to develop our own belief system that we as an individual, a very unique individual, can grow into. Then we truly discover what life has to offer and we truly discover all that we can be. Now the easiest way to change our belief system is a simple process which you can see in all the teachings of Jesus. The first is to establish what exactly do you want in life? What is it you value? Is there something missing in your life? You have a deep desire with inside that tells you there's more to life, there's more to you, but you just don't know what it is. It all begins with one simple thing, determining what it is you value in life. But wanting that isn't enough. We have to go one step further and set our intention on it. And when you set an intention, it's more than just wanting or wishful thinking. An intention calls on us to act, to move forward to do something to create that in our lives. See, too often we find ourselves going around the same old circular path of life, day after day after day, each time hoping that the scenery will change in the next round. But it never does unless we do something. Establish what you value in life, set your intention to get it. Now the next thing that we do, or the next thing that, that can help us uh, realize uh, uh, the higher quality of life, 
is to become mindful when we fall back into those traps where we're thinking bad things about ourselves or we're, we're negative about life or, or we're just disgruntled or in a great state of despair of some sort, be mindful of what you're thinking. And when you find yourself moving in that direction where your thoughts are not benefiting you and they don't feel good, what we do is we interrupt the pattern of our thoughts. And that's what our belief system is. It's a pattern of thought that we become accustomed to and we just continually, as I said before, go round and around the same old track. But it's interrupting that pattern and stopping it instead of the natural reaction. We walk into a situation, you don't like what's going on, you naturally react with resistance. It's just taking a moment and instead of reacting, we respond. Now the difference between a reaction and a response can be just a short amount of time, but it's that time to remember, this is not what I want in life, and this is what I do. And then we switch our thoughts to that which we want. The success that you experience in life, and the quality in your life, all depends on one thing, and that is your ability to respond to the world around you. That is it. If you stop and think about all the pain and agony that you feel, all the misery you feel, all the anger you feel, it's always, or in most cases, directed at something or somebody out there. But that's just the world. And we're not going to change it. We can get mad, we can pout, we can blow up, we can throw a tantrum. We're not going to change the world. It just is what it is. So instead of reacting to it based on that belief system that we were given, we now begin to respond to it in a way that expresses our values. We respond to it with patience. We respond to it with a sense of forgiveness, with a sense of acceptance, with a, a sense of love. Your ability to respond is everything when it comes to the quality of your life. And our responsibility, as human beings and as spiritual beings, our responsibility is to increase our response. Ability. As we go into meditation, I just want you to think of one thing in your life that you might want to increase, one thing that you really value. We don't have to take the whole, the whole kit and caboodle and, and say, I want peace and I want love and I want harmony and I want kindness and I want happiness. Just one little thing that you want to increase in your life, one little thing that you value. And as you leave here today, set your intention on seeing that increase in your life. As you go about your daily activities throughout the week, keep that in mind. We all want peace of mind, so we can just use that as an example. As you go about your life for the rest of the week, just think, I want more peace in my life. And when you find that peace within you being disturbed, you interrupt that pattern, and you develop or increase a response within you that allows that peace to happen. We'll now move into meditation.